Hello. And those famous places were on the route of the London Marathon. I travel past them on, on my, the easy way, on a push bike, and you can see where I went a bit later. But first, news of the birthday dog. Straight after Monday's programme, I took all your cards, there were tons and tons of them, great sackfuls, round to Goldie, and of course her birthday cake. Or rather, what was left of it, because Jill, as you remember, got stuck into the cake, and it was rather worse for wear. Anyway, this was the scene at Diana's, and Goldie's friends, eagerly awaiting some cake, are Bumble, Delphi, and Venny. Well, it was all over within about five minutes. They'd demolished it, and there wasn't a single morsel left. All the pups fitting well? They're doing really well. They've, they've grown a tremendous amount. They've put on a, a pound in weight, so they're all over two pounds now. Um, they were all trying to suck from Goldie while she was feeding at the cake. And their noses have changed colour now. They're not quite as pink. And they're just starting to open their eyes. I would think by tonight, in fact, most of them will have their eyes open. Well, by the way, we've had lots and lots of letters saying, please, can I have one, one of Goldie's puppies? Well, I'm very sorry, but the answer is no, because of their guide dog connections, at least four of the puppies are going to become, we hope, guide dogs. And the other one, that's the bitch, is going to go and live with my mum and dad on the farm at Dethick. Well, that's lovely, because you'll be able to get to see her then, won't It'll you? be great, because we'll, I'll be able to keep in touch with it. And, of course, Goldie will as well when she goes to Dethick. So that should be great. Looking forward to that. And now for news of one of Britain's most famous sportswomen. See if you can recognise this face. She's the person who's made two solo Atlantic crossings, who survived storms and icebergs, and who skippered nine men and two women in a 27,000-mile round-the-world race. She is, of course, Claire Francis, who was in this very studio five years ago, together with her boat, Golly, after she'd made the second of her solo transatlantic crossings. There can't be many people in the world who can appreciate man's struggle to conquer the oceans better than Claire. For two years now, she's been working on a spectacular television series. The first episode is on Sunday, and uh, it's full of what I can only describe as absolutely sensational photography, like the moment when, during her voyage from Lymington to the Isle of Scillies, Claire approaches the Needles, which is just off the Isle of Wight. These shores have always been famous for their treacherous tides and swift changes of weather. So much so that Julius Caesar was thought quite mad to try to invade Britain. Even as recently as 1944, the Allies had to delay D-Day and the invasion of France by 24 hours because of the weather. Today we're getting sudden squalls of rain that build up in a moment. Ahead of them the wind is gusting maybe up to 40 miles an hour. With this kind of weather and all the hazards of the coastline, the rocks and shoals and shallows, it's not surprising that there are still so many wreckings off the British coast every week of the year. We've reached the Needles at the extreme western point of the Isle of Wight. There's been a lighthouse here for nearly 200 years. It must have been terrible here before. It's often foggy and the approach can be difficult at night, even with the light. I can see that the Coast Guard on the headland is flying a storm warning. I think we've got rather too much sail up at the moment, but I don't want to reduce sail quite yet, as we're just getting into this nasty little patch of water. It's caused by the tide racing over the shoals, the submerged rocks which lie beyond the needles. In 1972, some friends and I planned a trip across the Atlantic in a small boat. Well, one by one, they all dropped out of the Enterprise, and uh, there was only me left who wanted to do it. Somebody bet me that I wouldn't cross the Atlantic single-handed. And I thought it was a great challenge and a great opportunity. Well, by the time I got here and met some very nasty seas, I didn't think it was a very good idea at all. In fact, I was very, very frightened. And I was quite literally sick with fright. And we're absolutely delighted that Claire is paying us a return visit. It's lovely to see you again, Claire. Thank you. Those pictures of you on board your boat, the Gulliver G, look beautiful, really did. But that first programme isn't just about you sailing, is it? No, really the voyage is just for me to look at the history of, of the sea and to find out why people sailed down to the Scillies as long as 4,000 years ago. And we found out they went there to find flint, 
Uh, they went there to hide from re religious persecution. Or indeed, the Vikings went there to raid mm. as a, a base for, to raid from. So, uh, in fact, faraway islands were quite a good uh, place to go to, although it was very, very difficult and tricky for them to get there in early boats. Mm, I can't wait to see that program on Sunday. How old were you when you first went sailing? Well, I was just five, I think, when I first went, but I didn't enjoy it at all. And I think, if I remember right, I screamed and asked my father to take me back. Uh, we were in a dinghy, and I thought it was going to tip right over. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you were glad that you went back to it, though. You must have had dozens of terrifying experiences since then. What's been about the worst for you? Oh, I think the very worst was undoubtedly during the single-handed transatlantic race of 1976. Mm. And at that time, uh, it was very foggy, and I knew I was quite near the icebergs. And I actually woke up one day, found it was quite clear, and I'd sailed between two icebergs. Oh, my goodness, and you only realized... Oh, it was after morning. the event, yes, yes. So I was very lucky. I bet, yes, you were. Um, you've made so many voyages over the seas. Have you ever explored beneath the waves? Well, yes, in the last program, in this coming series, I actually went down in a submersible one mile under the sea, which I think was the most exciting thing I've ever done. And down there, the pressure is so immense that uh, you have to go down in a sphere, which is just two inches thick, but it's made of titanium, which is a very strong metal. And the pressure down there is something like two metric tons per square inch. Mm. Uh, so it doesn't bear thinking about if it all collapsed. There hasn't been much of me left. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, but it, it's a fascinating world down there, and they're just beginning to find out all about it. it. Must have been very, very interesting down there. How long were you down there altogether? Well, it was about eight hours. Well, it takes an hour to get down there. Mm. And then uh, the scientist who was also in the sphere with me, with the pilot, he was uh, taking samples from the seabed and looking at the animals down there and so on. So there was a lot of scientific work. Mm. And then, of course, it's an hour back to the surface. But it went very, very quickly, and I only wish I could have gone down again. Mm. Are you planning any more long-distance voyages? Well, not in the immediate future, no, because I've uh, got a young son, Thomas, who's just over two. Mm. And I think I'll stay at home until he's a bit bigger. Oh, well, let's hope that we keep in touch with you in the meantime, Claire. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us again. And I'm jolly glad that your programme starts at quarter past seven because it means that a great many children will be able to share your adventures too. I hope so. Here's another excerpt from Sunday's programme, and it's filmed in the evening just as Claire approaches the Sillies. Sailing at night, of course, has special dangers and difficulties. For example, distances are very difficult to judge. In fact, I once thought I was sailing straight up a beach and later found I was at least two miles off the shore, so I was perfectly safe. Navigating at night along a coast like this is relatively easy nowadays. When the weather's clear, as it is now, you can see the light of a major lighthouse almost all the time. The oldest known lighthouse was built by the Egyptians at Alexandria, and what a feat of engineering it must have been. It was 350 feet high. But then, the Egyptians were a very inventive lot. They made many advances in the use of sail. welcome moment of peace and quiet and that dreamy felucca brings back very happy memories of our expedition to Egypt. Well if you're keen on the sea and sailing I'm sure you'd love to borrow this brand new book which is going to be published next week. It's based on Claire's programs The Commanding Seas. I say borrow from your local library because at 1250 it's rather an expensive book to buy but that's no doubt because it's full of superb colour photos like that one. Well, now from a very courageous sportswoman to our very own sportsman, complete in his marathon kit. <laughs> yes, and this is uh, my outfit for Sunday. Now, on my back, I've got a nice big blue Peter ship, so you should be able to pick me out amongst the uh, other 7,500 runners. I've also got uh, a couple of little uh, ships on my hip. Now, my bib here is my number 6612. It's also got that metallic uh, strip, uh, which is, goes onto the floppy disk that we told you about told you about last Monday. And the great thing is that everything I'm wearing is all lightweight, and I've even had me barnet cut uh, to cut down on wind resistance. Now, I'm going to attempt to run the course in three and a half hours, and to pace myself, I need to know on various parts of the route how fast 
I should be going. And last week, I spent a day checking the course, and very nice it was too. The view from Greenwich Park is superb. In the distance, you can see St Paul's, and miles beyond that again is the finishing point of the marathon near Buckingham Palace. The London Marathon is known as the race of two hemispheres. And this thin brass line here in Greenwich Park is the reason why. It's the zero meridian. Now, my right foot is in the eastern hemisphere, whilst my left is in the west. And the marathon runners will actually cross it, so they'll be racing in both east and west hemispheres. The race begins at the southern entrance to the park, and anybody watching can then take a shortcut to the bottom of the hill down there and watch the runners pass through Greenwich. There'll be no need to hurry, though, because the runners have to cover five miles of the course before they reach that point. On Sunday, 7,500 athletes will stream past this point as they head eastwards on the first part of the race. I decided to cycle around the course and catch some of the sights on the way. To begin with, the marathon route passes through the back streets of Woolwich, past the industrial riverside and dockyard, until it turns westwards again to get back to Greenwich. The runners will pass the National Maritime Museum. Visitors who come to see the race can also have a look at two of Britain's best-known sailing ships, which are berthed at Greenwich. Cutty Sark was one of Britain's famous tea clippers, the fastest ships in the world at the end of the last century. And it was in this much smaller vessel that Sir Francis Chichester made his epic solo voyage around the globe. Now, spectators can watch from here, and then they can cross under the river via the Greenwich Tunnel to the Isle of Dogs on the north banks of the Thames to see how the race is progressing there. Now, the best runners should take about an hour to get there, but for the spectators, well, it's just a 10-minute walk. I still had 20 miles of ground to cover and set off for Tower Bridge through the old Surrey Docks area by Limehouse Reach on the Thames. It's now a wasteland which is starting to be redeveloped. And while I'm struggling around this part of the course, the leaders will already be approaching Tower Bridge. The athletes will cross the bridge to reach the north bank of the Thames, and the front runners will be there in less than an hour after the start. Although the bridge is one of London's most famous sites, it's only 85 years old. Just by the bridge is St. Catherine's Dock. For more than 100 years, valuable cargoes of ivory, silver and spices were brought here. Now it's the tourists who come here to see the old buildings and boats, like the romantic Thames barges and old steamships. From Tower Bridge, the marathon route has its most gruelling section, a 10-mile loop round the Isle of Dogs. Experienced runners say the worst part of any marathon is around the 13 to 19 mile mark, when there's still a long way to go before the finish, and the tiredness really sets in. It's hard to imagine it now, but this was once open meadows and woodland, and it's thought that the strange name Isle of Dogs comes from the time royalty used Greenwich Park as their residence and crossed the river here to do their hunting with their packs of hounds. The organisers don't think many people will watch the race from the Isle of Dog, so the runners will be very pleased to see anyone who's crossed the river under the Thames to watch them complete the last 10 miles. Let's hope I'm there as well. The ride round the Isle of Dogs was quite tiring. I wonder how I'll be feeling when I reach here on Sunday. This was one of London's most notorious quarters, had an unsavoury history of robbery and murder. This highway was known as Ratcliffe's Highway, and at one time, running through it was the best way to avoid being robbed. The sight of HMS Belfast moored beside Tower Bridge will spur us all on as it's the start of the home stretch. Here, the runners will cross the cobbles beneath the 900-year-old Tower of London. Today, it houses the Crown Jewels, but in its time, it served as a fortress, prison, barracks, arsenal, and at one point, it even had an aviary within its walls. From the tower, the course runs along the side of the River Thames up the embankment. By this stage of the race, I probably won't notice the fact that I'm passing more of London's famous sites. The monument to the Great Fire of London and the magnificent St Paul's Cathedral. It was along here that Sarah, Simon, Rags and I paraded in the Lord Mayor's show last November. Blackfriars bridges are just two of the eight bridges along this stretch of the route. The leaders in the race will reach here in about an hour and 55 minutes. 
If I manage to get as far as Cleopatra's Needle, I think I might make it to the finish, which is only another two miles away. The trip by river from Tower Pier to Westminster doesn't take very long, and if they wanted to, spectators could watch the front runners at Tower Bridge, then travel to Westminster to see the rest of the field. The final stretch is up Birdcage Walk to Buckingham Palace. On Sunday, this part of the route will be packed with spectators, waiting to see who's going to be the first London Marathon champion. Oh, I've cycled 26 miles, 385 yards, and even that's worn me out. But here I am at the finish on Constitution Hill, where thousands of people will be watching on Marathon Day. I hope I manage to be amongst those that finish, and I know if I do, I'll be in a far worse state than I am now. And this is the trophy that will be awarded to the first man to cross the finishing line. And actually, it's rather good getting a look at it now, because determined as I am to finish, just in case you're wondering, there's no way I'm going to win or even uh, come in the first 500. Well, it's taking part that counts, isn't it, Peter? Yeah. Not winning, but look at all these. All your fans will be there cheering you on, including Simon and me. And these are just some of the many good luck letters that you've had and a painting yes. of you in action. The long hair there. Yes, that's lovely, isn't <laughs> Thank it? Thank you very much for all your good luck, Carsten. Thank you. It's ten years ago, next June, that the Blue Peter box for the year 2000 was buried deep in the ground at the front of Television Centre. Inside, there are all kinds of souvenirs of what was happening on Blue Peter in 1971, plus things like a set of decimal coins, because that was the year they were introduced. And the idea is that in the year 2000, the box will be dug up again so that people can find out the sort of things that were happening on the programme all those years ago. Well, it seems that a lot of people like the idea of burying important records in a sealed box, including the Class 8L of Samuel Lucas School in Hitchin. They wrote to say they'd like to bury the records they'd made about what life is like in the 1980s in the new car park that's being built at Television Centre just near the Blue Peter office in East Tower. We thought that sounded like a jolly good idea, so we've invited them to bring their records to London, and Simon's out on the building site with them now. And the six representatives of Form 8L are Carol, Andrew, Carol Giles, Andrew, Suzanne, another Andrew, and Emily. Well, welcome you representatives of Form 8L to the car park. We've got our box ready. We've got a great big hole here. So we'll get organised to put these things in. Now, Carol, if I can grab a word with you, Carol, how many subjects have you any idea have you got ready to put in here for these well, records? Well, some people did um, a project each and others put them together, but really we've got about 20 different subjects. 20 different subjects. Let's have a look at what we've got. We've got great big bundles down here. And I've had a look at these earlier during the day and they really are a tremendous comprehensive guide uh, to what kind of things have been happening and are happening in the 1980s. Now here, there's one on aircraft, for instance, a lovely colour for one there on clothes, one on sport, track and field events, that sort of thing. Nice bright one there on holidays. And how about this one? Playground games like Stuck in the Mud and things like that. And a wonderful one here on dance. And if we open it up, there's information on people like skinheads. There they are with those haircuts and the mods and if we turn the pages over there some more mods in typical modern 80s dress and how about that a phenomenon of the 80s there's some punks in their bright garish clothes and there's a disco dancer again something very typical of the 80s and the decade in which we're living and disco dancers in a, in a disco competition and this one was really unusual it's it's a record of all the crisps and sweets, would you believe, and typical crisps and sweets that people in the 80s are eating. And inside, there's even a little packet on the inside cover of various sweet wrappers that have been consumed. So there's another one to go in. Now then, Emily, can you tell me how you decided what sort of things you would include in your record and what you would leave out? Well, we just chose any subject we really fancied but we couldn't do something like prehistoric animals because they were alive years ago. We just really chose anything we liked. Now, Andrew, what did you choose? What was your subject to I record? I did aircraft. And did you do that on your own or did you have some help with friends? Well, I had another boy called Simon Nansel who helped me with it. And how about you, Carol? How long did it take you to do your record? Um, about ten weeks. And what, which was the one you did? This one. You did, you did the dance one? 
Can I just come back to you? Sorry, you're Suzanne. I'm getting confused with Suzanne. Carol, let me come back to you. What's this game called, uh, Stuck in the Mud? What's that all about? Oh, well, you've got a few people who chase a sort of team. And if they touch you, you have to stand still. And other people on your team have to crawl under your legs so you can start running again. Well, I'll tell you one thing, when somebody in the future digs this up and they read all about stuck in the mud and mods and punks, they're going to think, what a funny world we lived in in the 80s. Anyway, all those records are all going in the box, but there is more to come. Because here I've got a great load of Blue Peter records, and they're all relating to today's programme. There's a Blue Peter script, that's today's programme, in it goes. We've got some photos of cats, dogs, rags, and presenters, Sarah, Peter and me. And how about that? There's a wonderful photo there of Goldie and her puppies. That's in the box as well. Our signature tune is arranged by Mike Oldfield. And this is a can of film. I made this film out here 21 weeks ago. And uh, when I came out here, it was a total wasteland. So the lads really have been working hard out here. In that goes. Let's put all your others in. Pass them down the line. Exciting moment as we put these treasures in the box. On with the lid. Now, Suzanne, can you put your lock on? Shut it up. There we go. Two big strong lads around that end. Watch you don't catch yourselves on these spiky bits. All right. OK, lower away. Let me give you a hand with that one. Right, the box is in position. OK, and the next job is to put a huge concrete slab into place, and that's been brought into place by Tom, who is the site foreman, and Peter, who's a concrete ganger. And that weighs over a hundred weight. That's been lowered onto the box. Now, these spiker bits, which you can see, see sticking up, these are metal bits which will reinforce the concrete. And Peter Duncan has arrived, complete with sleeves rolled up, to put these in place over the concrete, bending them down with the aid of the other Peter. And that will stop the concrete from splitting. And the next stage is to bring some cement in because this is all going to be cemented down and level because this particular place where we're standing is the ramp on which all the cars will come up into the new car park. And so that the cars don't drive over the plaque that we've got to commemorate our box for the 80s, we're going to fix it up on the wall just over here. Smooth and it's that. going to be exactly opposite where the box is, so anyone who reads the plaque will know the exact situation of both our records and the records from Samuel Lucas. And the plaque is a beautiful work of art. It says, Blue Peter 1980s box. Beneath this ramp lies a record of life in Britain in the 1980s, compiled by the children of Samuel Lucas School and Blue Peter, 26th of March, 1981. Now, we're just putting the plaque up temporarily at the moment, because once the car park is finished, it will then be put up again permanently. Let's just stand back and admire our handiwork. What do you all think of that? Not bad, is it, that? How's the uh, concrete getting on, Look Peter? at this. Just the back to put the cement in now. The concrete, OK? Needs a big tipping job. This is there it is. Whoa! That's a fast look. I wonder how long it'll be before all that will be dug up again. Probably that's, another 100 years. What that's do you think? right, yes. And whether or not Blue Peter will be here, or even whether the Samuel Lucas School will be here in another 100 years, who knows that as well. Well, the concrete's on its way in. Looks like we need another shovel. Everybody got a shovel to give Peter a hand? No, I'll do it, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for coming along. Many congratulations to everyone in 8L for your records, which are now being buried for posterity. We will be back on Monday, and we'll have some of the world's top jugglers with us. They are the Flying Karamazov Brothers. And they've promised that they're going to give us a juggling lesson too, so anything might happen. We're also going to be having a very eventful weekend, because Simon and I will be cheering Peter on when he runs the 26 miles, 385 yards of the first ever London Marathon. That's provided he doesn't get stuck in the concrete at the end of the day. <laughs> and do not worry if you're not going to be able to come to London to actually see the marathon, because we, of course, will be taking our Blue Peter film cameras along to film it for you, and we'll give you a report on Monday. See you then. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>